Baldur's Gate 3 is a huge game and it can be pretty overwhelming when you first get started. Today I'm going to count down 10 new mistakes to help you avoid them and have a much smoother time exploring Faerun for the first time. Coming in 10th place we have not moving slowly or more specifically not knowing how to move slowly. Now if you're playing on consoles or the Steam Deck this is very obvious you just push the analog stick not as hard as you normally would. But if you're on PC most of the time you just click around on the screen you pie and make their way over to wherever you clicked at max speed. It can be difficult if you find yourself in a situation where you need to move with a little bit more care. What if you're in a cave and there are traps around every corner? You can spot them but every time you do it's too late as your party walks straight in before you can react. Now you can sneak but if people are nearby and see you this might not work. But something that always works is holding down left click. After a short pause your party will walk towards the direction your mouse is in and the further it is from the middle of the screen the faster they'll move. So next time you find yourself in a dungeon and want to move more slowly to scope out any traps before it's too late hold down left click and move ever so slowly to avoid unnecessary damage. Number 9 we have not quick saving like mad. I feel like this one has been said at least a thousand times but one more time for the monsters in the back who still haven't heard it enough. Quick save like the F5 key owes you money. Seriously outside of eating data storage there is no downside to quick saving before literally everything. About to enter a potentially important conversation. Quick save. Just enter the big fight. Quick save. About to initiate a war to wipe out a grove full of incense, including children and animals by doing so, locking yourself out of 50% of the content in game. Also, you can bang a sexy cultist. Maybe just quick save just in case she's not in the mood after committing genocide. If things don't go your way, you can just reload. While it can be fun to just roll with whatever happens like true D&D, especially when you're getting started, you will make mistakes. And the last thing you want is losing 30 minutes of progress because you forgot to hit a single button. Do not trust auto save. If you die in combat and your last save was 20 minutes before the battle even started, you'll be pressing another F key, along with alt, faster than you can say absolute. In 8th place we have you don't have to win everything. One of the first things you'll notice in Baldur's Gate 3 is there are a lot and I mean a lot of dice rolls. I mean it is a D&D game so I don't know what you expected. While some of these are sort of essential to make sure certain companions and characters stay alive, I would say a good 70% of them don't have drastically devastating consequences if you fail and sometimes even results in a more interesting outcome. While you could theoretically quick load after every failed roll, I'd encourage you to instead see what happens before you decide you need to reload and re-roll. You gotta see it kinda like life. Sometimes you try things and they don't work, but that doesn't mean your life is over, it just means that it didn't work out and life goes on in a different direction than it would otherwise. You don't have to accept every loss and can use inspiration and reloads when necessary, very big and important roles, but if you just chat to people and maybe want to deceive or persuade them, Maybe just see what happens if you fail. You never know, you might even get a more interesting result than you would otherwise. Coming at number seven, we have not looting properly. I cannot stress this enough, take everything that is not nailed down. I feel like this goes for most RPGs, but you can take pretty much everything that isn't nailed down in most locations. Now yes, in settlements, items highlighted in red belong to someone else and taking those will get you in bother, but in dungeons and caves, you can take pretty much everything. Now obviously with gear and gold, you can use those, but everything else can get a little bit confusing. So let's make it real simple. If it's worth more than say 10 gold and doesn't weigh as much as a house, then it's probably not a bad idea to take it to sell because contrary to popular belief, mo money does not in fact result in mo problems, at least as far as being poor. This also brings me to a bonus tip, wares and sharing the load. When interacting with items, you can right click and see a number of options, but the ones to focus on are add to wares and send to. By adding an item to wares, you essentially mark it to be sold and the next time you interact with a trader, you can automatically sell all of your wares to save yourself some clicks. And the send to option lets you send items to places. Wow, who would guess that? You can send them to camp which will store them at your chest back in camp or you can send it to other party members but you know you can just drag them across with tab but I digress. The point I'm making is share the load. I spent the first 10 hours of my game with everything on my main dude and everyone had basically empty inventories. Use their carry capacity to haul more loot around with you and keep everyone unencumbered for maximum efficiency. Coming in 6th place we have not using different characters for different things. Now I know this one may seem incredibly obvious but I can't tell you how many times I forget about it. Of course when you choose your main character you want to play as them as much as possible since they are basically your surrogates in this world, but they cannot be the best at everything. Even if it's something as simple as picking a lock or knocking the door down, switch someone who has high dex or strength because if it's higher than your tab stat, chances are they'll have an easier time. If you haven't started a game yet, I would highly recommend going in class as high charisma for your first playthrough as your main character, since you'll be able to get the most out of conversations rather than having your main dude sit in the back for pretty much the entire game. Just make sure before you get wrapped up in any action, you use the person who is the best suited to complete that action and you'll have a much higher chance of success. Also, when rolling anything, make sure support abilities that don't cost spells, aka guidance, are always being enabled. There's literally no downside for a high chance to get a good roll, what's not to love. Come to the midpoint, we have not getting enough rest. Just like in real life, 
Rest is incredibly important in game. You have two options of long and short, and both are incredibly useful in different ways. Short rests restore half of every party member's max hit points, as well as reset to your use limits on a number of spells and abilities depending on your class. You want to see this as a breather post battle to get your party back into healthy fighting form to continue the adventure a little longer before turning in for the night. Long rests do a large number of things depending on the story and relationships, but primarily they allow you to restore all health points for the entire party and fully restore spell and ability slots for all classes. This more or less resets your characters back to peak condition in pretty much every way, so if you're all out of spells and low HP after a long battle, maybe a long rest is all you really need. Long rests can also open up dialogue opportunities with companions for romance and many, many, many other events which I don't want to spoil as their best experience first time for yourself. Now when I first got started I was worried that long resting too much would cause time to pass in the game world and certain quests would fail or disappear, and I'm happy to tell you that is complete bull honky. You can rest as much as you want and as long as there's no event which specifically is triggered by a long rest, you'll be fine to take part in every every quest you can find at whatever pace you like. The only real downside of long rests is that they consume camp supplies, but if you're looting everything in sight, you should have plenty of these stocked up so I wouldn't worry too much. Coming in fourth place we have Don't Burn Spell Slots For No Reason. This one is especially important early on when using classes which rely on spells to deal all of their damage. In Baldur's Gate your spells work in a slot based system. Each time you cast a spell it consumes a spell slot, and the higher the level of the spell you cast, the higher the level of slot is consumed. This does mean that eventually you will run out of spell slots and will not be able to cast your more advanced spells until you take a long or short rest depending on your class. Now, I know that as soon as you unlock a new spell, the first thing you want to do is test it out in the first combat you get yourself into. And while you can do that, you'll be consuming a spell slot that you can't get back without to rest. This isn't a problem if you don't mind lots of rests, but personally, I like to leave long rests as long as I can so I can keep up some flow in my game without taking lots of breaks back to camp. So if I use up all my spell slots in the first battle of the day, my caster is then useless for the entire rest of that day. And if I get caught in some nasty combat, that can be a real problem. Like I said, this can be a playstyle preference thing, but if you ask me, I would save your spell slots for when you really need them, which is normally tough combat or a very important role. I mean, you wouldn't waste a level two spell slot on a 15 roll, would you? So double check what actions cost spell slots before you make a roll to save yourself a headache. Coming in third, we have not having good perception rolls IRL. This sounds like I'm insulting you, and I kind of am, but I'm also insulting myself, so it's all good. All I really mean by this is pay attention. This is a game with insane levels of detail, so paying attention to everything is the way to go to get the most out of your playthrough. This can apply to all kinds of things, but let's go through a few examples. Books and scraps of paper crop up all over the game, and a lot of the time it's just flavor text there to world build and to give more studious players something to chew on. But sometimes books and notes can hold the answers to certain quest lines and questions. For example, there are several times when there are puzzles in dungeons, and conveniently, the answers to those puzzles are written down somewhere nearby, allowing you far easier progression. There are certain bosses which can be pretty much one shot if you find a book and take note of the contents. Aside from books, you can also sometimes spot traps even if you fail a perception check in game. Your character can auto path onto pressure plates, but if you manually control them properly, you can avoid traps entirely, even without technically knowing that they're there. Like I said, this game is super duper detailed, so eventually you can get attention fatigue, but just do your best to take a closer look at most things and you can get so much more out of this already BMF game. Coming in second place, we have not consuming those consumables. I feel like this can be said for literally any game, Resident Evil heads where you at, but consumables are there to be consumed. There's not going to come a battle where you will need 400 health potions, 63 potions of speed, an elixir of fire resist and some drow potion all at once. They are there to give you aid when you want and need it, so feel free to use them pretty much at will. A lot of potions can give you effects until your next long rest, so don't be afraid to start each morning with a cocktail of elixirs to keep you in peak fighting form. If you avoid using them until you feel like you really need them, all you'll end up with is a level 12 character with a 150 carry weight worth of crap you're never going to use. Just use whatever you like whenever you want it and keep a couple of HP potions in reserve and sell anything you never use. I know it's hard and insurance can feel nice, but before you know it you have too many potions to count and then you're even less likely to use them with all the hassle of finding the right one. Speaking of potions, bonus tip, throw health potions. It lets you heal allies in an area where the potion lands, essentially getting you more healing per potion and letting you do ranged healing combats even if you have no spells. It's not super necessary and you might never need to do it, but it does work this way and can come in clutch if your cleric runs out of heals. And in first place we have not eaten the damn tadpoles. This one really makes no sense, so I wouldn't really call it a mistake as much as I would call it a very poorly explained mechanic. But over the course of the game you'll come across more mind flayed tadpole specimens, and the game implies that by consuming them you can gain more power, but it will come at a cost. This of course makes you think you'll get a worse ending if you decide to consume them, but this could not be further from the truth. With the exception of one very specific tadpole unlocked later on which I won't spoil, but trust me, you'll know it when you see it, there is literally no doubt downside to eating all of the accursed gummy worms that you want. All you really end up doing is locking yourself out to a really neat tree of different powers and abilities that will make the game easier and more fun. If you're really hardcore roleplaying, then you don't have to take them, but if your only reason is that you're scared of ruining a good alignment run, then don't worry a single bit. You can consume every single one you find and just be fine, so go right on ahead and enjoy. 
And that's my list. Did I miss any mistakes you think should have made it? Let me know in the comments below. Like, subscribe, and if you want more Baldur's Gate 3 content, then why not check out this video here to see my Gotrek and Felix builds video. Yes, that's two builds in one video. You're welcome.